Good morning, everybody. We're back. This is Squawk Box on CNBC Europe. Google posts a record quarterly profit, topping off a strong week for the tech sector. Meanwhile, IBM jacked up its profit guidance. And I'm Steve Sedgwick. Carrefour exits Russia after just four months and denies any plan to abandon emerging markets. That as third quarter sales fall nearly 3% on a challenging environment across Europe. At U.S. economy bellwether GE reports third quarter earnings. The parent company of this network looks to its industrial business to offset troubles at its credit crunch hit finance arm. Uh, very good morning then to Hugh Hendry as well, who joins us around the desk. Hugh is CIO and partner at Eclectica. Uh, good morning, Hugh. Good morning, Jeff. Nice to see you. Um, just very quickly then, give us the line. How do you see the markets? Uh, I, um, I have no idea. No, I see the, the markets. I, clearly, everyone is uh, crowded into the markets. So my view on the market, to answer your question directly, is I think it's all one way. It's all one trade. There's no diversification. You're either in the market or you're not. Um, I'm not. Uh, how's performance then? I suppose I should you ask. Yeah, you can't make money if you're not. <clears throat> um, so um, I, um, I'm a risk officer, if you will. Okay, and if you find an environment where you can't diversify, if you find an environment where you have to share the trade with everyone, then the risk is that at an inopportune moment where you might have to exit that trade, you'll find that everyone is joining you. So um, that would be a point where your capital would be in jeopardy. I, um, I'm the second largest investor in my fund. Yeah, it's, just, it's all of my, my capital. I've earned and I've accumulated this over the last 10 years. And I won't jeopardize my capital um, for even for the rally as great as it is today, I won't jeopardize it to participate in a crowded marketplace. You've just reiterated, obviously, what you, you've said is a very cautious, very defensive stance, which our viewers have become very uh, aware of over the years. But, but my problem as well is comes in that, as you say, a vast amount of liquidity. Everyone's into everything at the moment, very little discrimination. Do you fear that some of those more defensive trades which you've been advocating um, have seen a bit of money coming into them so that actually when the market does turn around and these asset classes such as equities and corporate bonds and all these other ones which potentially have gone too far, do you feel that the asset classes you believe should benefit from uh, their decline won't because people have put money into those ones as well because there's just too much money around? Um, I don't think there's too much money around and that's a contentious point to make because this time last year the American central banking authorities increased the monetary base by a thousand percent. And if you recall, when I've been on previously, I've been kind of pumped up with the debate because, if you will, my intellectual opponents have maintained that inflation is a monetary phenomena. And last year we spent the, the period spraying the room with money and therefore there would be inflationary consequences. Here we are one year down the road and actually you find that bank lending continues to contract. Now you're right in the sense that um, risk assets, inflationary assets like equities and commodities have gone higher and it gives the impression of this wall of money pushing it higher. Um, the remarkable aspect if you look at the stock market and the recovery from the March lows is the absence of volume associated with it. If we are to say that March marked the historic low we can then compare it with the lows of 1932 and 1975 and 1987, etc. And what you find is the trading volume since March and over the summer are almost like 60, 70 percent below the great turning points from history. So I don't believe there's a wall of money, um, and I certainly don't believe there's a huge people, a queue of people uh, wishing to buy risk-averse assets. I struggle to break down these volume figures. I mean, you look at the headline figures, you're absolutely right. I mean, I look at the, the average vo daily volume on the NYC, for instance. So 1.5 billion shares is the yearly average. It's been around about 1.3 the last couple of weeks or so. But the problem is, below that, I don't know who's doing anything. I, cause there's so much high frequency trading out there, program trading. I, I struggle to see, though, Hugh, even as you quite rightly say, there's lower volumes and, and that hasn't signaled what would be this wall of money, even within that, where the real money is. Yeah, well, I, and. I I think the conundrum, because the, um, the bulls will tell you, you better get in, 
because there's a lot of people sitting on the sideline. Maybe that's an interpretation of what I've just said. But they said that in 2007. You know, they said that all the people that had been chased out after the TMT collapse, that they were sitting on the sidelines and they would come in and they would propel the market higher. They didn't come in. And I don't think they'll come in this time because the providers of money to fund managers, you know, the mm -hmm. private uh, family offices, the last 10 years have been horrific. Yeah. Stock markets are no higher than they were 10 years ago. And we've had two incidences where 50% of your capital has been destroyed in a year. So the people with money don't want to give it to the guys who manage money. The guys who manage money are very, very, they're singing and clapping and very happy. The people with money are like me. I've got money and you know what? I'm not impressed. I'm, I like having money and I fear that if I give these guys my money, they're going to lose it. That's what they've done for the last 10 years. So we're sitting pat. Yeah, they all think they're heroes since March, I think, a lot of these guys. Right, let me have a look at uh, one or two deals.